Gerard said, go ahead. Good evening. Welcome to UTSA's Hispanic Heritage Month activities. My name is Myron Anderson, and I am proud to serve UTSA as the Vice President for Inclusive Excellence. Hispanic Heritage Month is special at UTSA, as it is an opportunity for many elements of the university and the community to come together and implement a programmatic synergy thus communicating so many important elements of Hispanic heritage. As we are in the third year of formalizing the activities for this month, we are seeing programs throughout the university and the community grow each and every year. This year we have connected to over 30 programs, each telling a story related to Hispanic heritage. It is an exciting, it is an exciting time to be a part of UTSA, and I am looking forward to tonight's incredible event. And always remember, it's a great day to be a roadrunner. Now, I'd like to turn this program over to our Vice President for University Relations, Teresa Nino. Thank you, Myron. And thank you all for watching tonight. On behalf of our 35,000 students and 5,000 faculty and staff, I welcome you to uh, UTSA's Hispanic Heritage Month and our uh, speaker series. This evening, we'll hear from Shay Serrano. Uh, Shay Serrano is a New York Times bestselling author, a journalist, former teacher, and San Antonio native. And what you may not know about him is that he's also a philanthropist. Shay grew up in San Antonio's Valley High community on the Southwest side and attended Southwest High School. He went on to get his college degree in psychology from Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas. And while at college, he joined a fraternity, Omega Delta Phi. That's a multicultural fraternity started in the mid 80s at Texas Tech to help students graduate. After college, he moved to Houston where he worked in construction and then as a middle school science teacher. Shea began writing in 2007, first as a freelancer for the Houston Press, and then hired by its sister publication, LA Weekly. As a journalist, Shea's writing includes pieces for many different publications, including GQ, ESPN, LA Weekly, Rolling Stone, MTV, and Vice. Shea wrote and illustrated his first book, Bun B's Rap Coloring and Activity Book, in 2013. Two years later, Shay made the New York Times bestseller list with his book, The Rap Yearbook, the most important rap song from every year since 1979, discussed, debated, and deconstructed. That book also went on to make it to Billboard's top 100 music books of all time. Shay's third book, which got published in the fall of 2017, Basketball and Other Things, debuted as number two on the New York Times bestseller list in the advice category, but was listed number one in the sports category. And as, that, as if that weren't enough fame and publicity, that December, then President Barack Obama listed it on his Facebook post as one of his favorite books of the year. Shea's fourth book, Movies and Other Things, came out in the fall of 2019 and also became a number one New York Times bestseller. Shea continues to write and just two years ago started a publishing house, Halfway Books, to provide opportunities to up and coming writers. And this is where the philanthropy comes in. Shea has established a scholarship with the San Antonio Association of Hispanic Journalists. He also, back in 2016, started the FOH Army. I can't say what the F stands for, but the OH stands for out of here. The FOH Army, uh, Shea Serrano's social media followers that support his causes. Oh, and did I mention that he has over 400,000 media followers, social media followers? After a post on Hurricane Harvey back in 2017, he and his FOH Army raised over $130,000 in just one day. The first 90,000 came in within four hours. There's so much more to Shea, and I hope we have enough time to share that with you. So without further ado, I welcome Shea Serrano to UTSA's Hispanic Heritage Month uh, speaker series. Welcome, Shay. What's going on, homie? <laughs> Wait, can I get a Roadrunner sign out of you? <laughs> is that what this is? Yeah. Do you, yeah. It, is that a, a saying at, at UTSA, it's a great day to be a Roadrunner? <laughs> um, it's the first time I heard it, but we can make it. We can make it a saying. Whenever uh, I wake my sons up in the morning to get them ready for school, I say the same thing, but I say it's a great day to be a Serrano. And <laughs> it just made me smile when he said it. Oh, good. 
Um, so let me ask you, because most of our audience here tonight is uh, our college students and our faculty. So let me ask you about your college life. What was your college life like? Uh, it was it was cool, I guess. It was scary at first. Like you mentioned, I grew up on the south side of San Antonio. Everybody there was like, I don't know, for the first 17 years of my life, everywhere that I went, everybody looked exactly like me. You know what I mean? The yeah. school that I went to, it was it was always a room full of Mexicans, and it was you know, uh, and then when I left to go to college, it was like that. Everything got flipped upside down, and I was like, oh shit! Oh excuse me! Oh shoot! <laughs> uh, oh yeah, we should have warned you about that. <laughs> we uh, we yeah, when I got there, it was like uh, all of a sudden, every room that I walked into, nobody looked like how I looked. So there was a culture shock. At first, I think at Sam Houston at the time, there were 15,000 students there, and I think they had less than 100 Mexicans, which yeah. was just the craziest thing that I had ever uh, seen. So that part was weird, and then, you, you know, you start reaching out and making friends. You mentioned that uh, fraternity Omega Delta Phi, which they build themselves as a multicultural fraternity. It's like if there's 40 members, 38 of them are Mexican. And then there's like a black guy and an Asian guy. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I found them and I was like, oh, this is cool. This makes me feel a little uh, more comfortable. But then, you know, you get there and I was the first one in my family that graduated high school. I was the first one in my family to go to college. Uh, so nobody had like any, any like firsthand advice. It was just like good luck, I guess. And then, you, know, you show up and get real bad grades for the first couple of semesters until you figure it out. And then you get less bad grades and then you graduate. And that was... That was my college experience. Wow. You know, and, and everything that you touched on right now, it's stuff that we see with our students as well. You know, we have a first gen program, a program to help first generation students, because just like you said, if you come from a family that didn't go to college, you know, someone that can help them navigate and all that, that's a real challenge. And then also uh, another thing that you mentioned, and that's about, you know, identity and, and you know, who do you connect with? I was going to uh, wait till later in our questions to share this with, uh, with everyone watching online. But, um, but I wanted to share this, and this is a post you put up earlier this year in August. And uh, and could you describe <laughs> this? <laughs> yeah, this is a, this is the closer for the Mets walking into the stadium, and then the video is there's a guy playing a trumpet, and it sounds very much like uh, like Mexican music, and everybody in the crowd is going crazy or whatever. It's just a silly uh, little thing. But as I have uh, started this career like working in tv and movies and stuff the further up you go the like less of us there are and so and so again like you start finding yourself being the only one in the room who was like you so it was just a little little joke i was making well but it, but it's true a lot of people do feel that way and and you know they're they're actual terms that you know describe that whether it's imposter syndrome when when you feel you have to pretend to be somebody else just to be able to you know make it through you know or there's code switching when you know you're you're very comfortable in one way but in order to present yourself you have to um you know you have to act like someone else um or or just you know speak differently act differently um and and one thing that's very clear about you is your authenticity um, what gave you that confidence to be so authentic and genuine and, and just say what's on your mind? You know what it is? Here, here's, a, here's a very uh, straight arrow answer for this that always uh, helps me is a couple of years ago, uh, LeBron James, maybe the greatest basketball player of all time, LeBron James opened a school in his like home state. Uh, for kids, they go there, and then I think if they make it all the way through, they get free college tuition, right? It's this incredible program that that just skyrocketed the graduation rates, and all these kids who were probably not going to get the chance to go to college suddenly, that was a the thing they didn't have to worry about. All they had to do was work hard, and they had the chance, and whatever. It was just beautiful, beautiful program, and you, you watched it go up, and you watched it happen, and, and people were very excited about it. And then, all of a sudden, there was this whole other group of people who were mad about the way that he did it because they didn't think he did it the right way. I think well, like they were mad that he didn't pay for a hundred percent of everything. He like partnered with 
other businesses or, or, or corporations or whatever, which is what you're supposed to do, by the way. But they were like, well, he's a he's got five hundred million dollars or whatever. He can pay for these kids' college tuition or whatever. Whatever. They were. It was a bunch of idiots just being mad about something. But I remember watching it and being like, man, if they're mad that this guy who started a school that will put hundreds and hundreds of kids through college for free, they're mad that he didn't do that the way that he they wanted him to do. People are going to be mad about everything, no matter what, no matter how you present yourself, no matter how you walk into a room, no matter how you speak, somebody's going to be mad about it. So just do what you want to do and then don't worry about that part because they're going to be mad anyway. So they're going to be mad. You might as well do it how you want to do it. And so there you go. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's, that's also resilience on your part because, you know, to fight off the haters, I guess you could say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's a, that's always, that's always part of it. And, it, and it's going to exist every single where all of the time, no matter how big or how small uh, you think a situation might be, somebody's going to be upset about a thing you did or didn't do or said or didn't say or how you said or whatever. Right. So right. just, just do what you want to do, man. <laughs> you know, it's um, especially during Hispanic Heritage Month. One of your re recent posts was um, you said, "Hey, it's Hispanic Heritage Month. You have to give ten dollars to every Mexican you know uh, and yeah, not yeah. racist." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Always. So how much uh, money did you make? Because, or, or actually, how many people responded to that? Because I did see that several folks did give out ten dollars for something or other. Yeah, yeah. I kept, I kept seeing people would send me like screenshots or whatever that somebody sent them ten bucks. It was just, it's, it's, it's a, it's a goal of mine to, as often as possible, make white people feel a little uncomfortable. <laughs> and so that's what that, that's what that was. Well, in, in all this about raising money, let's talk a little bit about the FOH Army. And, and remember, noticed how I did not give the definition of what the F is I, for, I but I'm guessing, I'm guessing that people could figure it out. But um, yeah. but yeah, so the FOH Army, um, how, how did that happen? Did it just happen organically? People just started contributing or did you, and I, for Hurricane um, Harvey, you put in the first $200, but there was also a situation where you were very pleased that a parking lot attendant at the airport helped you find your car and, and the FOH Army raised $3,000 to give him a real good tip. <laughs> yeah, she was, her name, uh, Ray Dell, her name was Ray Dell. I'd gone, I'd been on a business trip. I came back, I was super tired and annoyed and I couldn't find my car, I was so mad. And she helped me, she drove me around for like 30 minutes until we found it, she was the best. Uh, the, way that, the way that that happened was, uh, it was completely, by accident. I had, in 2015, I quit teaching. I was a teacher for nine years at a middle school. I quit teaching in July of 2015 to become a full-time writer. And then in October of 2015, the place where I went to go work got shut down. So I had like three months of being a full-time writer and then I had gotten fired. And it was like, oh shoot, welcome to journalism, right? right. Um, but, but I had signed a contract. So the parent company that owned it they were like, we're going to honor your contract. You're going to get paid for the full year that you signed it um, if you want. But what that's going to mean is you can't write for anywhere else. You're just going to sort of chill out and, oh. and run the clock out. And so I was like, yeah, that seems like a pretty good deal to me. I'll just do that. It was like eight, eight months of a paycheck for doing nothing, right? And like three weeks into it, I got super, super bored and was like, this kind of sucks. I do, I do want to I I write. So me and, and my buddy Arturo Torres, who illustrates the books that I do, him and I started a newsletter, and this is 2015, right? Uh, so we start this newsletter. We're doing it like just, it's it's a 100% it's free. I'm just doing it because I want to write and I can't write somewhere where they're going to pay me or else I'll mess my contract up and I won't have a job or a paycheck. So I started the newsletter. We're writing it for free. And it was, and it was on basketball, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a basketball newsletter. It was coming out once a week, every Tuesday at 9 a.m., and we were doing it for a few weeks and all of a sudden what was supposed to be this like goofy little side project, we got, you know, 30,000 subscribers in the first week or two. And it's like, oh crap, this is crazy. And, and, when you, and when the list gets that big, you have to now pay a couple hundred bucks a month to use the, the website that serves it. Uh, it was a MailChimp at the time. And so people were saying, hey, let us like contribute a dollar or two and we'll help pay the monthly bill. And I was like, no, don't worry about it. It's cool. It's cool. 
We did for like three or four weeks. And then finally I was like, all right, you know what? I put a little button, like a donation button in the newsletter that went out. And I was like, hey, if you want to send a dollar or two or whatever, like you can do it here. And it went out. And then very quickly we raised like a couple thousand bucks. And I was like, oh, shoot. Um, I gave some of the money to Arturo because I wasn't paying him very much. And then um, Arturo, who grew up in Dallas, him and his mom and his uh, brothers, they lived in a woman's shelter for uh, for, a, for a while because uh, his father was abusive and they like needed a place to go. And so he was like, hey, let's take that extra money and donate it to, it's called Genesis Woman's Shelter in Dallas. He was like, that's where I grew up. They were the first ones who gave me my art supplies. Like it was a big thing. And I was like, all right, that sounds cool to me. So we donated all the money. And then the next week we updated everybody and we're like, hey, that money that you sent, like here's what, what we did with it. And everyone was like, oh, that's so great. Great job, whatever, whatever. And then like a month later, we did it again. And we put the donation button in there. And everybody was like, what are you doing with the money this time? Where are you donating it? And I was like, well, shoot, I was just going to keep it this time. But I guess <laughs> I guess I got to donate it. So then we donated. It was right around Thanksgiving. We donated it to some like uh, children's uh, feed the children type of thing. Um, and then it just started like that. And then it became a thing that people were expecting us to do. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, by like a two years or so later, we were, we had donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to different nonprofits or, or whatever. But again, just completely by accident, you know? Yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful. And then I know, um, because I'm a member of the uh, San Antonio Association of Hispanic Journalists, that you've also started a fund for, uh, for journalists, young journalists there. I, I believe it's a $5,000 scholarship that they give out every year in your name. Yeah, yeah, that was a, that was a cool one to do. Um, it was something Larry and I had talked about a bunch. We, I, I remember seeing this like report that had come out that was showing like, like 3% of the publishing industry is made up of Latinos and it's a similar number in journalism and whatever, whatever. And I posted it on, the, on Twitter and I was like, man, this sucks. And then somebody said, well, what are you going to do about it? And I was like, oh, I guess you're right. I, I need to do something about it, I was a little something. And so I just started looking around and then I found out about SAHJ. We set up that scholarship there and then it just, uh, yeah, it was like five grand a year every year for a few years. And then we just started setting up more and more scholarships at different places. We did another one through UTSA for, uh, for like a, Laramie, my wife is a therapist. Mm. And so she's super into like mental health. She's a black woman as well. So she was like, let's set up a scholarship for like black students who are trying to be in the mental health profession or whatever. You know, you're just, just trying to do whatever you can. And we don't know how to do all this stuff. But we're just like, well, here's some money. We'll give it to smart people and let them get it to people who need it, you know? That's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. And, and, and not only in those kind of situations, but also um, you got the FOH Army to donate to uh, not just Hurricane Harvey, but also to children's shelters, to all these other places, and, and also to causes. So, um, I mean, that's just really admirable, um, you know, for you to be able to do all this. And um, in addition to that philanthropy, um, your publishing house now, Halfway Books, um, I saw a quote somewhere that said how that was really to help students because, um, or I'm sorry, uh, to help writers who don't get the opportunity to, um, you know, to write for free or, or can't afford to be writing for free, but want to get a, a start somewhere. Could you, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah. It's like a, it's the goofiest thing. It's a pretend publishing company. Everything is just digital. There's no like print anything. Um, but like, for example, I have a short story that I wrote that I will just publish through that. And then you treat it the same as you treat a book, like you hire an editor and a layout designer and, and a producer to produce the audio book and a, and a copy editor and a fact checker and whatever. And then you just do like you were making a book, except it's all, it's like an ebook now and you can publish it online and then you sell it just direct to, to consumers. But I did that a couple of times. And I was like, oh, this is kind of neat. I made a little bit of money off of it and just take some of that money and then hire, like, I think the first time we did it, we hired, I hired uh, five young writers and had each of them write like 3,000 words about a rap album, one specific rap album. And we had like a couple of Zoom sessions being like, well, here's how you should maybe approach it. Here's what I would do, blah, blah, blah. I had them work on that. We did it. We made the stuff, published it. 
and then they were just selling it direct to them. We didn't take any of the money. Uh, it was just like, yeah, like, you know, lower the ladder when you can type of thing. Yeah, that's that's great. And and tell me a little bit more about the publications. I know that um, um, I, I purchased Angel when I saw you come out with that one, but you just put one mm. out about uh, pre-order. <laughs> and, um, and, and what can you share with us? It's going to be a couple weeks before it comes out, right? Or before you release it? Yeah, that one comes out October 26th. And that one is, it's about, uh, it's about an, it's an, it's a story about an action hero that I have been wanting to write for a long time. So it's just like a, like a John Wick type character that I made who is in a situation that he has to get out of. It's super dumb. It's so dumb. When everybody sees it, they're going to be like, I can't believe I had to pay for this nonsense. Um, but because it's my own like publishing company, I get to sort of do what I want and I don't have to worry about, I don't have to worry about selling a bunch of copies because I'm the only employee there. So there's, you know what I mean? Like you just, you know, again, do what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's very liberating. <laughs> it really is. Which, which of your publications are you the most proud of? Not necessarily the one that's the biggest seller or the most popular, but the one that you really feel that you know, you accomplished something with it. You know, what ends up happening is you write a thing and it comes out and you're very proud of it. You spend like a book, for example, two years working on it or whatever. And then uh, it comes out and you're like, yeah, I love this thing. And then you talk so much about it in interviews and you spend so much time uh, like reading it or rereading it and copy editing it, doing whatever that by, the, by like a month later, you hate it. You're like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. So like every book that I've put out, I had never went back and reread it because I did it the first time with the rap year book. And I was like, I hate this. This is awful. I can't believe I did this. And so every book that has already come out, every short story that's already come out, I hate them. But every one that's about to come out, I think it's the best thing I've ever done. So this new one that I did, that's my favorite one right now. Only because nobody has seen it yet. Nobody has been able to like poke me in the eye about it yet. <laughs> And uh, we're, well, let me ask you this, because I, we've been talking a lot about, about the writing, but when did you know you wanted to be a writer? Because it, it, it seemed like it just came up as an opportunity, but I mean, the way you've been sticking with it, the, the way your support for journalism, and it just seems like there's, there's something in there. You've had a passion there for a while. I, did, I, I like it a bunch now. I didn't, it wasn't like a thing I liked in school. It wasn't even a thing I was trying to do in college or whatever. Um, Again, you if you grow up on like in like that part of San Antonio, they don't tell you, hey, this is a job you can. Oh, you like basketball? People get paid to just write about basketball, or people get paid to write about. They they don't. They, what they tell you is, hey, do you want to go? Uh, you want to go do uh, irrigation with your uncle, or do you want to go do? Uh, you want to go lay some tile with your other uncle, or do you want to work at a tire shop with your other other uncle? Like those are the things they throw at you. You know what I mean? So when I got out of school, I didn't know that this was even. A thing uh, but the, like the quickest version of the story is I was teaching my wife was teaching she got pregnant with the twins she had some pregnancy complications at four months she couldn't go work back to work anymore so all of a sudden we were we went from two people together making like a combined 85 grand a year which when you're 24 years old is like a million dollars we went from that to all right, now it's a family of four making $42,000 a year in Houston. And it was like, oh crap, we need money. Uh, and I was trying to like, I tried, I applied at Walmart, at Target, at Papa Do, like I was applying everywhere. Just, I just needed a, a job to get us to the point of when she could go back to work. And, but nobody would hire me because I already had a full-time job. I couldn't work when they needed me to. So I was just straight up Googling work from home jobs. Writer was one of them. And I click on it and they're like, you need the internet and a computer and I was like well I got both of those so I guess I'll try this and then I just started trying to to write with the with the intention solely of just like making it to when Laramie could go back to work um, and then we got to that point of like all right she's ready to go back and then we looked into daycare and she was going to make I'll never forget this she was going to make $2,200 a month as a teacher to go back and daycare cost $2,100 a month Oh, wow. And I was like, well, what are we doing? We can't even, I, cu I couldn't even afford for my wife to go back to work is how I felt. And I was like, man, I got to do something about this. But we were just sort of stuck. 
And I was like, all right, well, I'm going to just, I guess, build this up. And then just, you know, over the course of several years, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then now here we are. Well, it's it's a great story in, in regards to, you know, what a great outcome. And and not only, you know, for you and your family, but also you're, you're paying so much of it back and helping others. You know, so that's really inspirational. And, you know, one of the things that we like to do during Hispanic Heritage Month in the speaker series at UTSA is, is showcase successful Latinos, Latinas, because you're exactly right. People need to see themselves in successful people. They need to see other role models uh, as opposed to the people that are just in, in their everyday life that may not have those those careers or may not have had those career opportunities in their lives. So, um, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that and for uh, recognizing that <laughs> and speaking to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, everybody always is like, thanks for being a role model. And as I promise you, I wasn't trying to do any of that. <laughs> I was just trying to get keep the lights on, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But what would you say? What would you say if, if you were talking to, let's say, high schoolers at Southwest High School or, you know, or somewhere else and in the neighborhoods of San Antonio, what, what advice would you give them? Or even our own college students who are, um, as, as I said, feeling a little, you know, needing that kind of inspiration. Uh, advice in, I guess, what res like what respect, you know what I mean? Yeah, um, well, um, for students that, um, that wonder if, if it's even worth it, what they're going through for, you know, for school or, you know, leaving, maybe not leaving their families from their home, but still it's like you go home and you, and you're one person at home and, and then you're at school or at your part-time job and, and you have to act a certain way. And, you know, it's that kind of, um, um, that mixed emotion. Yeah, I get you. You know, you know, what always helped me is, uh, anytime I was like scared to do something or, or nervous about it, or wasn't sure if I had like if it was even going to work out or not. I just always thought about how, uh, like, that time is going to pass anyway. So, like, let's say you and I were having a conversation, uh, and, uh, or if I'm talking to, like, a student, and they're like, man, I really want to I want to be a writer. And I'm like, that's cool. You should do that. Here's what I would try to do if I were you. And they're like, all right, cool. And then four years later, I'm going to run into that kid again. Those four years are going to pass either way. So, like, I, you might as well just try to do the thing. Anyway, because you're going to be, you know, you're going to be 26 years old uh, at some point, And it's like, do you want to be 26 and you tried the thing that you wanted to try? Or do you want to be 26 and you didn't try the thing you wanted to try? Either way, that time moves. So, like, you know, do something with it. Because the, the worst thing in the world is, like, regretting having not done something. Like, that's the stuff that that sticks in your head forever. Like, even little, I think about stuff like, like stuff I should have said in a moment 17 years ago. Like, man, why didn't I say that? Why didn't I stand up for this person? Why didn't I stand up for myself? Why didn't I say this or do that or whatever? I, I never think about like, oh man, remember when I stood up to that one guy and he he like beat the hell out of me? Like that that doesn't bother me. The stuff that bothers me is like when I didn't do the didn't right. do the thing. And that's what I try to put again in my own kids' heads as well. Like, man, you just gotta you don't want to regret it because there's no, there's no way to unregret it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's good advice. Um, well, one of the things that we did was we asked students and, and members to um, to ask questions, like what questions they would ask you. And we <laughs> we got several of them. And um, and maybe if we, we could start addressing them. They're random, so there's really no order to them. But um, first question is, you appear to be a big supporter of the WNBA. You know, why is that? Uh, it's just, it's fun. It's basketball. I like basketball. Basketball is my favorite sport. And, you know, they're good at basketball. So I just try to watch all the basketball that I can. That's, a, that's an easy, that's an easy question. Because <laughs> no, I like it. Yeah. But I guess, why, <laughs> why, yeah, why the women's NBA as opposed to the men's NBA? I watch the men's NBA too, but the seasons are at different times. Like the, the WNBA, they just, their, their playoffs are during the summer. And like the the men's NBA that that just started now, so like, you know, I, I just want to be watching 
whatever basketball is going on. And, and the NBA and the WNBA, that's like the highest possible level for the men and the highest possible level for the women. We're talking about the greatest players yeah. on earth. So like I turn the game on and watch, watch them play. And, and there was a follow-up to that. And uh, what is your opinion on the pay disparity between the men and women's um, basketball? Oh, it's, it's miserable. Like it's the dumbest thing. They should, there's no reason. I think Diana Taurasi is the highest paid player in the WNBA. And I think she makes something like 225 grand a year, 250 grand a year or whatever, something like that at that level, which is absurd. Like, Again, she, she, that might be the greatest women's basketball player of all time. If not the greatest, she's top five. Like, there's no question about it. There's no reason that she shouldn't be making more money. Even, even if it's like the NBA and the WNBA are, they're, they're like, they're, it's, it's an, an interleague. You know what I mean? Like, they're connected. You just take some of the money here. Tyler Hero, who plays for the Miami Heat, just signed a contract where he makes like $30 million a year. And Tyler Hero is like, I mean, that's great for Tyler Hero. I'm super happy he's making that much money. But like, what if you made $29 million a year? You know what I mean? Like, and we just move some of that over a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, okay, I get the feeling that this one uh, was sent in by, by one of our faculty here. Um, what do you think of the trajectory of the UTSA football program under Jeff Trailer's leadership? Do you follow oh, man. football? I, I, all that I know, I got a buddy. He works at a, <laughs> he works at a, oh, the bar, the barbecue place Pinkerton's downtown. His name is Joe. He's a writer. He goes by Taco Joe. That's his name. And he's the biggest UTSA fan. Really? I, know. And I, I follow him on Twitter. And so all of the UTSA football stuff that I know is only because of him. And so like well, I was watching when they were going through the playoffs or whatever, seeing him like be very excited, very excited and then sort of heartbroken. Um, but it's cool that they're good. It's certainly, it's certainly better that they're good than if they were bad. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll have to do a shout out to Taco Joe. <laughs> we're going to have to go fight him. <laughs> yeah. He's the best. Um, so if San Antonio were to get a professional football team, what do you think they should be named? Oh man, we should we should just steal the Raiders. I feel like we've been trying to get the Raiders for twenty five years or whatever. The San Antonio Raiders sounds dope. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in on that. Um, and then this one's looking at at uh, state politics. I guess it's um, that um, Texas uh, just the Texas demographics show that Hispanics are now uh, the largest or are the majority in Texas. Uh, mm -hmm. What is your opinion on that? I guess that Hispanics have are now a majority of Texans. Oh, I love it. I think it's the greatest thing uh, in the in the world. Like we should keep we should keep running it up. You know what I mean? <laughs> like our our numbers are such that we can sort of, if we were united, which we were not, uh, but if we were, we could control like a lot of a lot of things. We're a significant voting block now. Like. We have to be courted. We should, you know, we should use that leverage to sort of advance the most of us is how I feel. Um, now, here's a question. Uh, and I guess it's been noted that you follow the Spurs quite a lot. <laughs> and, yes. the question, and the question is, if you had to choose Timmy or Manu? Oof, that's tough. I mean, I, it has to be Tim. Tim is the fifth, maybe sixth greatest basketball player of all time. The Spurs won zero championships before Tim Duncan got here. And then he was here and we won five and then he left and we're, you see how we are now. Like it's, it's Tim. I, I now Mono is probably more beloved in San Antonio. He's like, it, he, he's always felt like one of us. Uh, but, but if you're picking one player, it's, it's always Timmy. <laughs> Timmy. <laughs> And let me see, we just got another one. Um, uh, when I was in the Navy basketball, what kept me connected to my family back in San Antonio was basketball and other things and the right book at the right time. And from a fellow Southwest Dragon even, thanks for what you do, Shay, especially the motivating tweets 
just about every time I need one. Any updates on the upcoming show? How did that come together? Oh, well, that's so dope. Have, yeah, right? Yeah, that's real dope. Nice. Um, the show is great. I'm here in Los Angeles right now. We're mixing episodes. Uh, so the show is, it's been written, it's been shot, it's gone through, we're in post-production right now. We're at the like last stages of post-production where you make the sound right and you make the color right. And then it comes out uh, next year and it's going to be super cool because it's set in South San Antonio in like the Valley High neighborhood and it's awesome. There's no like, Valley High is maybe, is maybe not the greatest place to grow up. You realize when you leave, when you're there, it's like, this is the best place I've ever been in my whole entire life. And then you get out and you're like, oh, I get it. I see, I see now. Everybody's not, everybody in the world is like not on food stamps like we are, or like your people didn't, like everybody's people are not in and out of jail or your house, everybody's house is not getting foreclosed on or whatever. Like I get it. Um, but when you're there, it was, it was great. So when I make the show set there, it's set in, in Valley High, but there's no like, nobody gets shot or like, you know, it's just like a family making jokes and having a good time. And that's the whole thing. Everybody's going to love it. They're going to think it's the greatest show that's ever been made, except <laughs> everybody who hates it and thinks it's the worst thing that's ever been made. <laughs> that's what's going to happen. And for those that don't follow you on Twitter, which I can't imagine who that would be, but um, but give us a little background about how that came out or how that evolved. Because I know that when we were when we were emailing back and forth, you were talking about having to go to LA and, and getting things done for this new venture. Yeah, the way that the the show ended up happening was um, I, I I put a book I put basketball and other things out. Um, it did really well. Uh, my name had like a little bit of heat on it. And so people like different agents in Hollywood started reaching out like, Hey, have you ever wanted to do TV stuff, whatever, whatever. And um, there was one who had like tried for a couple of years to get me to do something. And I, I like had some free time. I wasn't teaching anymore. And I'm like, all right, I'll give it a, a try. I flew out to LA. I met with a bunch of people. Uh, one of those people is this guy named Mike Schur, who did uh, the office the Parks and Rec, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, The Good Place, like every great funny TV show for the last right. 20 years, Mike did. And so I walked in a room, he was there. We, we got to talking. He was like the nicest dude that I'd ever met. And he's like, yeah, we should do that thing together, that show that you want to do. Like I told him a little bit about it. And whenever, like if Mike shows up and does that, everybody sort of pays attention. So then me and Mike go around and we pitch it to like all the different networks and, uh, and you know, then they bid on it and somebody ends up buying it. It's at Amazon. Amazon is who, is who like, they, I guess they won it, I guess, or I won that, or I don't know how it goes. Um, but yeah, that's like it, it, when you have Mike with you, this is the same as like if you walked onto a basketball court with Tim Duncan and he's like, Hey, I want to play basketball and this guy's on my team. You are, you're going to get to play in the game. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's the same way in Hollywood. You walk onto the court with Mike and Mike's like, Hey, I want to make this show with this guy. Everybody goes like, cool. Welcome to the club guy. <laughs> uh, no, no experience or, or uh, anything. And then you just, you know, you spend a year and a half working on it and learning everything. And now here we are, I'm ready for it to be out. And when is it again? When will it be out? Uh, all I know right now is 2023. But okay. I don't know exactly when, hopefully early 2023. Okay, we will keep an eye out for it. <laughs> um, I promise question. I'll let y'all know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is your favorite basketball moment in your life? Ooh, my favorite basketball moment in my life. Like, oh man. You know what? I, this is, this is going to be a, a, a dumb answer, but maybe... There are no dumb answers. <laughs> maybe, it's the, maybe it's the best answer because there are a bunch, like, the 2014 Spurs championship yes. is my favorite championship that's ever, ever happened. Uh, 99 was huge because that was our big one. 2003 was was huge because it was like, well, they won in the shortened season. Can they do it in a full season? Uh, 05 was great because we had just gotten our hearts broken in 04 with the Lakers and we had to beat the Pistons. And that was a, that was a, uh, when Robert already hits the shot in game five and like a, 
they're all, you know, 2007, we just sort of ran away with it or whatever. But I think my favorite basketball moment, maybe the one that as I've gotten older has become more and more important is, is I was a tiny kid. This is when the Spurs, this is pre Alamo dome. They were playing in the hemisphere arena. I don't know if you remember when that was happening. Um, this was like pre David Robinson, like my dad, my dad for 33 years drove a, drove, drove a bus for Via, right? And as part of the, uh, like his job, when the Spurs were terrible, they would just give tickets away. Hey, to our drivers, you want some tickets to the game? The Spurs are 12 and 37 on the season or whatever. Was this um, when they were so the ABA instead of the NBA? This was after the ABA. Yeah, this was after that. Um, but so my, my dad and I would go to the games all the time. And we went to a game one time. I was maybe like six or seven years old, maybe eight, old enough to remember being there. But we're at the game. Uh, the Spurs have the ball there on offense. The shot clock is winding down. The ball gets like knocked back into the backcourt on defense. So, like a pass gets deflected. So it's going into the backcourt toward the other team's goal, just rolling on the floor. The ball is rolling, rolling, rolling. And the Spur, one of the Spurs players who's at the top of the key, it gets knocked over his head. He turns around and he just takes off after it, like fast as he can. He's running. Me and my dad are in the Hemisphere Arena. We're sitting way up at the top still, but we're watching this guy. The ball's rolling and the guy's running after it. And it's getting closer and closer to the out of bounds line. And he's going, 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 and he's not going to make it. And he just full body dives for the ball, just full body, oh, like that, right? Like lays all the way out, like a center fielder trying to catch a pop fly. And he dives for the ball and he misses it. And it rolls out of bounds, and he rolls out of bounds, and like slides out of bounds, and the whole place just goes friggin' nuts. Everybody's cheering and yelling. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Spurs are down by twenty-five points or whatever. Who cares? They're all going nuts. And I was like, and I remember asking my dad, Dad, why are they cheering? Like, he didn't get the ball. We're getting our butts whooped. Why is everybody so excited? And he just, uh, in like a very like old man mexican dad way he just like turned and looked at me and he was like because he tried son he tried and then just turned back to the game and was watching it and wow. that, and that has just stuck in my head forever he didn't get the ball but he tried he did everything he could possibly do and everybody celebrated him for that and so from that moment forward or i guess when i became a, certainly when i became a father going forward and this has been it has been my intention to always measure effort, not results. And, and you know, stuff sort of works out if you do it that way. Um, but yeah, that one, that one is always up in my head. That's a great story. That is right. a great yeah, story. No, yeah. All right, I'm glad, I'm glad. <laughs> and now that you mentioned family, so your first writing, your early writing, um, when you were freelancing, um, was a lot of stories about family and home. How does your family, Laramie in particular, feel about uh, you writing about family business? Uh, she's she's fine with it. She, I mean, we make sure I don't I don't write anything that she doesn't want me to write. I never I, I never write like disparaging things about it. I'm just always trying to to celebrate stories similar to the one that I just told right now about my dad. Like yeah. that's the kind of stuff that I want to put out there because I think that that is. That's the, that's the important stuff. That's the stuff that needs to be told and shared. And so they're all, they're all cool with it. The TV show is about my family. Um, I mean, my mom and my uncles anyway. Um, they're, you know, everybody's pumped about it. Yeah. So, so I did warn you that the questions were going to be random. And this one, um, I think, is from, uh, from one of your followers. It wants you to name your favorite Lou Diamond Phillips movie. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, it's got to be, it's got to be La Bamba, right? And, and it would go La Bamba and then Stand and Deliver. Those, those are the, those are the two. And then I guess if you need a third place, uh, like a podium finisher, uh, like Young Guns or whatever. Um, but, but, but La Bamba is like, he's incredible and La Bamba is so good. <laughs> and let me see, we have... Oh, when are you going to publish uh, a book on the best tacos in South Texas? Yeah, never. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I don't want to write about writing about a taco. Seems like the like just eat it. 
what are you doing? You know <laughs> what I mean? Don't write about it, just eat I don't it. Don't write about it. I just want to eat it. <laughs> and I'm not sure what this means. Royal Rumble coming in January, overpriced, worth the money. Does that make sense uh, to you? Yeah, it sounds like somebody's asking if they should pay for the tickets to go to the Royal Rumble because it's going to be in San Antonio. Royal Rumble is this big wrestling event. Okay, you should, right. you should absolutely go to the Royal Rumble if you can. Like that's that's it's such a fun time. I only went. I don't even think I've ever been in person. I went to like a wrestling thing. They did it. I think at like the Alamo Dome one time. It wasn't the it wasn't like the WWE or whatever it was at the time. It was like a knockoff one, but it's so much fun. They would do it in. We live in Houston for 14 years, and they have like an independent wrestling league that's up there, and it's just great to go watch these athletes throw their bodies around, and it's so much fun. <laughs> and here's a parenting question. Uh, what are two or three movies that you think are must-watches for your kids as they reach adulthood? Must-watch movies. <sighs> must-watch movies for my kids, Blood In, Blood Out which is my favorite movie of all time. It's the, I think it's the best movie that's ever been made. Um, Selena, which they've already watched. Even, I think Jennifer Lopez is incredible in that movie. Jennifer Lopez is so good that all of the Mexicans that were mad that there was a Puerto Rican playing Selena <laughs> were like, after we watched the movie, they're like, all right, it's fine. She, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. That's how good, that's how good she was in that. And, uh, and, the movie Blade with Wesley Snipes when he's the yeah. vampire hunter. That's just, I just, I rewatched it like two days ago. So it's in my head. Wow. I'm going to make sure my kids have seen all three of those movies before they go off to attend the University of Texas in San Antonio. <laughs> that sounds really good. There's uh, what, what action movie for the rest of your life? Which one? Oof, just one. Now, the, so the distinction to make here is that a movie like Bloodsport, that's not an action movie. That's like a fighting movie. So I'm not counting, I'm not counting any movies where they're like fighting like that, right? So yeah. if it's just one action movie, you know, I think, I think Predator is the best action movie that's ever been made. I think it's better than Die Hard. Everybody goes crazy for Die Hard. But you have, you have like mercenaries in a jungle fighting an alien. And, and like, it doesn't get too much better than that. So give me, give me that one. I'll watch Predator every day. <laughs> okay. And do you have any new podcasts coming up? I do not. Uh, I'll have a new podcast come out when I get a new check from a podcast company. Then I'll be in it. <laughs> but until then, no thanks. Okay. Let me see. Okay. This one's, sorry, this one's a little long um what is what are you thinking of the backdrop of that we're losing the sense of community in san antonio over the neck over the last few generations i think that's true but i don't think it's a san antonio thing like i'm watching it happen with uh, with my own children, like I think about they're they're in the tenth grade right now. The twins are in the tenth grade, right? And I think about when I was in tenth grade, what was I doing? And so much of my life was like, you get home from school, and then you go outside, and you're like friends live on the same street as you, and you all get together, and you're like, what are we gonna do? You want to walk to Miller's Pond and like play basketball and get in a fight? They're like, that sounds pretty great to me. And then you do that together and you're, you, you just hang out for a few hours and then you come back home and you do it again the next day. And I think because, the, because everybody has a cell phone now, because the whole entire universe of in, information is available to them at all times, uh, you sort of start to lose that part of it. Um, it's sucky to watch happen. You, gotta, you have to be like very proactive as a parent. You're like, all right, well, we're, we're not going to have phones during this time. And you need to make sure that you're like, are you participating in a sport? Like one of my kids is on the basketball team, for example. And my, one of my other kids, he's got like a group of friends that they hang out like a couple times a week. Like you're just trying to make sure that that is happening because if you don't, it's so easy to get, to get lost in the phone. To, 
I was talking with, with uh, one of my boys the other day about this exact thing because um, I was telling him when I was growing up, it was like me and, and four of my buddies, right? And the only people that I had to like, that I could compare myself against were these four idiots who I hung out with all of the time. So if we went to the park to play basketball, for example, I'm like, man, I'm the best basketball player in the world because I'm better than these four people who I hang out with. Or like, man, I'm the second most handsome guy in San Antonio because my buddy Miguel is more handsome than me, but I'm like second place. I'm feeling really good. And the kids today, they are like comparing themselves against the greatest like athlete or the great, or like the most handsome person or the most talented singer or the best musician. Like that's what's put in front of them all of the time, all day, every single day. And that's got to sort of weigh on your, your head a bunch. Be like, why am I not special like this? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's it, it, like, I don't know. I think about it a bunch, but yeah, I, I, I think you have to be very proactive with your own kids with that. And I'm sure I'm not doing a good enough job, but I'm going to keep trying. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm sure you're doing a great job. And, and I mean, just being an inspiration to so many people um, that, that has to, that has to um, account for a lot. Um, and, and again, random, we were just in this very, good place talking about you know family community and um and now it's a question of if aliens came to san antonio and yeah. only had two hours to spend what would you tell them to destroy do or see oh man i would tell them you know what i would do i would tell them to go to uh, mendez cafe this is assuming they showed up in the morning and this is assuming that they had uh, cash on them because Mendez Cafe, you can only pay in cash. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's over like off of military. Okay. Um, it's my favorite <laughs> breakfast taco place. I, that, we would go there. We would just walk in. This is also assuming that these are aliens like, like, nice like, aliens. From, ni like from 1974 that when they have the big heads and they have big eyes <laughs> and, and they, they have like human type bodies, not like movie aliens that you see today that are like yeah all kind of shapes or whatever like we would just walk in there and sit down and chill out and eat do yeah. aliens have teeth that's a that's a well, that's what the, i need to know those modern ones do they have those big teeth that come out yeah yeah see all but right. yeah but no you're right the 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 older aliens are more easier to to deal with <laughs> i i think i think you could because i think you could like put a hat on them <laughs> and nobody would and nobody would even they would they would walk in they're you know they're real like skinny dudes and they'd be like i flaco or whatever like it'd be like that and nobody would even care right they bring them more food and more food <laughs> yeah yeah okay you always talk about shooting your shot how do you make it work with a family compared to being on your own uh i I think it's sort of the the main thing that happens when you have a, a family. Shooting your shot, of course, just means trying to do the stuff that you want to do. Yeah. Um, when you have a, a family, especially your parent, mother, father, whatever, like you owe a responsibility to your partner and you owe a responsibility to your children to like make sure that the stuff you're responsible for is taken care of. So I think like that's got to be the first part of it. And then after that, like then you can try and do the other stuff that you want to do. Let's say, let's say, uh, before my like writing career sort of became what it became, I was teaching, right? So I'd go to school and teach and like work full time and then come home and be with, be with Larry, maybe with the kids. And I was like, all right, I'm not even going to touch the computer until the kids are asleep because that's kind of like a jerk move. If I just come home from work and then start working on my other thing, like that's selfish. If you if you have a family, like you have to be mindful of that sort of situation. Um, if you're by yourself, then just just go crazy. Do every <laughs> single thing you do every single thing you can at all times, because eventually that won't be that won't be the case anymore. <laughs> okay, well, well, we'll have to put like um, some parameters on that because we're also looking at college students who are on their own, and and we don't want them getting too too wild. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, don't go crazy. 
Um, and speaking of that, and and, we'll, and this will be our last question because I know we're running out. And as I said, I knew we were we were going to run out of time because we just got so many questions. Uh, thoughts on building a sense of belonging and owning your voice in a room where we're the minority. Yeah, I think um, I think about that a bunch. Um, here's what here's what I can say to that there has never there has never been a time where being uh latino being black asian and being not white there's never been a time where being not white was more of a benefit than it is literally right now like that's what they're that's what they're looking for you were just talking about about uh latinos being the largest voting block in texas now like we like we have the numbers now, right? So that means that everybody is going to be looking for, for insight into that community. Um, that uh, how do we access that? How do we like make the best use of that? Whatever. It's the same thing when I walk into these rooms to like pitch TV shows. Everybody's like, man, the Latino market is super underserved. We're looking for Latino content right now. Whatever, whatever. Like, like it's very easy to walk in and be like, oh, oh man, I'm the minority here. Like everything is stacked against me. And to, to a certain degree, it, it 100% is, it will always be harder for you than it will be for a white guy. That's just what it's going to be. But at least right now, they're, they're like, if nothing else, pretending to care. You know what I mean? And, yeah. you just, and you just take advantage of that. And you do like what we always do, where you give us this much space, and we get in there, and we start wiggling and making that space <laughs> bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, and then, you know, hopefully we get to a point when we sort of can call our own shots and make our own things and hire our, our own people. And, and there you go. That sounds great. And, and, and you know, I just one thing that um, Latinos are the largest demographic now in Texas, but we're not the largest voting black. Unfortunately, we still lag oh, yeah. behind on that. Yeah. See, but um, there you go. yeah, it's register to vote, get out and vote. But, uh, but thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. Thanks for making it. Thanks for being here. I had no idea that you were already in LA. I know that when we looked at the time and trying to schedule all this, so I really, really appreciate that, uh, that you made it. That, yeah, you came through. Yeah. Thanks so much. And we got to get you happy to, to. to a football game. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I get, uh, I get asked to do like 30 of these every from September 15 to October 15 every year. <laughs> and I always, I always say no. This is the only one I've ever said yes to. Really? But, oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you yeah, so yeah, much. Yeah. That means so much. Thank you. Oh my, well, and thank you to everybody UTSA. else. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Don't forget the road runner side. <laughs> there go. you go. Thank All you. Right, and thank, thank you to our viewers for watching. Um, and right. uh, have a great rest of your evening. Right. Good night. All right. Peace.